side. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the path of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved, and who will go with me? Come, friends, without delay. Taught by the Bible, led by the Spirit, we'll walk the heavenly way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Brother Blaine, would you mind opening us up in prayer, please? Amen. All right, take a seat. Turn to hymn number 61. Hymn number 61, Savior like a shepherd lead us. Number 61. Savior like a shepherd lead us, much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed, us, for our use thy folks prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. We are thine, do thou befriend us. Be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us. Seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and 
sin for the baby. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us seek Thy favor, early let us do Thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with thy love our beings fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Turn to hymn number 411. That'll be our next song. We don't typically do announcements on Sunday evenings, but I did just want to mention something. We do have a number of items on the table in the fellowship hall by the bulletin board that are, quote-unquote, lost and found. If they are yours, please go and grab those so that we don't have all this stuff hanging on the board. (laughs) There's a number of things. There was a thermos that I found today that was seemingly abandoned. So if by any chance you're missing something, it might be in the fellowship hall. So take a look at that before you leave this evening. Hymn number 411, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise." Just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that he is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust him more. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Amen. I was going to mention, uh, people have asked, I think mom is on the mend, and thank you for asking about that, and uh, pray for her and dad, and dad is just fine, but he's staying home taking care of her. 
and uh, I think she probably needed that, and uh, that's a blessing. And I did also uh, want to mention that immediately after service tonight, um, after Jameson's announcement, everybody not involved with the Christmas play can go pick through the lost and found. Because immediately after church, Miss Twyla and those of us working with the play will begin a practice. And I promised to be prompt, and I think that the practice will be prompt. Yes, ma'am. Yes, and once again, do not forget a teenager's Christmas party uh, coming up, 55 and older. And they said it's going to be like a Dirty Santa or gift exchange. None of them really know how to play Dirty Santa. They're all too nice. But they do have a nice gift exchange. And uh, that will be a, a, a gift of your choosing, ladies, um, for the ladies' gifts, $15 or so. And guys, just ammo, flashlights, and pocket knives, basically. Just bring something like that. That'll be fine. What date is that? Nine. The 9th. So that'll be coming up. And uh, if you're 55 and older, you ought to do that. That'll be a great time of fellowship. I prefer that age group to uh, kids. The older I get, the more I like that group. Amen. Before I preach, our kids are going to sing and uh, come and sing, God is good all the time. It's an old one, but a good one. It's one that's easy to get stuck in your head a little bit. Um, it's a good reminder that no matter what's going on, God is good all the time. Amen? start out with this. God is good all the time. And all the time God is good.
Amen. I don't really know how you can sing that one without smiling a little bit. Amen. God is good all the time. Even when we don't understand. That happens sometimes. Amen. Things happen we don't understand. God's still good. Well, this morning I preached out of Philippians and uh, really... I had kind of uh, just cut the top two or three points off of a bigger message. And so we're going to pick up where we left off and really finish verse 28. We looked at verse 27 this morning of Philippians chapter 1. So if you would turn there, I'd appreciate it. And we're going to get into a message. I told you the name of it could be titled, We Ain't Scared. Amen. Do you know you don't have to be terrified or scared if you're a child of God? Amen. And uh, perhaps you're in a situation where your life is really, really good and you just don't even think about fear. But a lot of people in this day and age can be motivated and driven and tormented by fear. And uh, as children of God, we need to understand what He says about the things that the world fears, we don't necessarily have to fear those things. So if you would stand with me, look at Philippians chapter 1. Once again, this message is aimed at those of us that are saved. He was writing to a group of believers there, the church at Philippi, and I gave some background on that this morning, so I won't rehash all of that. But let's look at verse 27 and following for our text tonight. Paul says, "...only let your conversation..." Be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Lord, we love you and praise you. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to meet as your children. And God, we just pray that you'd speak to our hearts tonight. Pray for those that are out a little under the weather. Pray for my mom. Lord, I lift up others that are also ailing. I know there's a number. And we also lift up uh, those in our prayer list that may be having spiritual issues and struggling. God, I just pray for your hand of guidance and blessing and healing. And Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters that are here tonight. Lord, that we would be encouraged and edified and built up in your word tonight. That we'd be challenged, convicted if necessary, and we would be comforted by your word. And Lord, prepare us and equip us for the work of the ministry this evening. Lord, I just pray that if someone here this evening is lost, never been saved, your Holy Spirit would reveal that to them and they would trust you is our prayer. And we thank you for what you're going to do tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So, as we look at the uh, passage tonight, we uh, want to kind of pick up where we left off. The Apostle Paul has given them basically what his expectation on them as believers, as Christians. He says, let your conduct, let your conversation. And if you were here this morning, that word implies your behavior as a citizen, your lifestyle based on who you are as a child of the kingdom of God. There's a certain level of responsibility and expectation. And he says that your conduct should be as it becometh the gospel. And here's how that should look. And I I like this phrase. I didn't really focus on it this morning. He said that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. How many of you know that stuff gets around? People talk. Amen? And you know what bothers me is when someone gets all riled up about people talking about them. Because that's just going to happen. Amen? Listen, can I just say this? If you don't want people talking about you or being critical of you, don't ever say anything, do anything, or be anything. Amen. And then they'll still talk about you for being sorry in that regard. So you're going to be uh, talked about. And I like what Paul says. He says that whether I'm there or absent, I'll hear of your affairs. I'll hear of how you're doing. Do you know it'd be nice if when word came about you to someone not here, that it was praise report, that it was positive, that you are doing well. And Paul said, I expect to hear good news from you, that you are conducting yourselves 
the right way as becomes the gospel. And that would look like, we covered this this morning, standing fast in one spirit. That you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And as we pick up tonight, I think it's interesting that when he says that you're striving for the faith of the gospel, the word faith in the scripture uh, can, can have a couple different meanings. It's by faith that we're saved. Faith is a living trust, trusting God and believing Him, believing God and believing in God. That is faith. Hebrews says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When we believe what God has said and act accordingly, we are demonstrating faith. But many times when the faith is mentioned, uh, sometimes it refers to saving faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The faith of the gospel is saving faith. But sometimes it's much broader. And faith includes basically the whole of the Christian experience. Christianity itself can be referred to, for example, in Jude 3, when he says, I exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered. The idea that the whole of God's revelation to us and our confidence and belief in it is the faith. When you contend for the faith, that in Jude uh, verse 3, that almost sounds to me a little bit like apologetics, like you could go to bat defending the faith that you have. The historical Christian faith, we call it. Can I just say this? If Jesus Christ did not live in history, He couldn't live in my heart. Amen? And so there is a responsibility as citizens of heaven to be able to give an answer. As Peter said, sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer. If anyone asks you a reason of the hope that lies within you, you ought to be able to give them an answer. And so in one sense, striving together for the faith could include the idea of contending for the faith. Not being contentious, but knowing how to defend what you believe. Can I just say this? The cults many times operate with a blind faith, but not Christianity. Christianity is not a blind faith. Listen, Mark Twain said, faith is making yourself believe something you know is not true. Well, that may be the case in other religions, but in Christianity, we believe the truth of Scripture. Listen, if it's not true, I've got better things to do with my weekends. Amen? Amen? But Jesus did live in history. He was crucified and He did rise again. Listen, He changed the world. I mean, we, as hard as the enemy tries to separate us from God and His story, Jesus Christ is the primary figure in history. And what you do with Christ is important. And He says here that we together should strive together for the faith but primarily the faith of the gospel. That means that you can either be advancing the gospel, or do you know that even in the church, it's possible that you could be a hindrance to the gospel. It's possible. Listen, a child of God living in the world, living like a lost person, is a greatest detriment to evangelism. Many people look for the excuse to not believe. But he says, you, I expect you to be striving together for the faith of the gospel. There should be unity, cooperation. And he says that we should work together as a team for the faith of the gospel. Acts 16.31, the Apostle Paul had told that jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's faith. The faith of the gospel. And can I just say this? There's saving faith. There's the larger picture, the Christian faith that we defend. Do you know that just daily faithfulness, many times, if people could just see you being faithful, it would sure help the arguments for the larger picture, the Christian faith, and what you mean when you try to explain to somebody trusting Christ in saving faith. So he encourages us to cooperate, to have, have this uh, unity for the faith of the gospel. I think one of the greatest hindrances in modern American evangelism is the fact that there are so many professing believers in Christ that are so divided up. Now can I just say this? I'm not saying that labels are bad. Sometimes it's helpful to know where someone's coming from. 
But can, but can I just say this? As a child of God, we should have a spirit. Jesus came to send a sword, the sword of the Word of the... Listen, the Word of God will divide people. But those of us that stand on the Word should unite together. And what I mean by that is the... the first of all, you may say, well, what does that look like? Well, unity in the church means don't be snotty to your brother and sister in Christ. Right? Well, they, they don't like me. Well, maybe they think you don't like them. Amen? Hey, can I tell you something? It's not been that long ago, and I won't mention names, but I, I had one uh, introvert telling me that they, they just felt excluded from everything, and including, you know, and they mentioned a few people, and two different people in that group felt the exact same way. You know, now, a lot of times it, you see it in, in, in children, right? Yes, so, so kids, you know, there, there will always be a, a little... Cl and by the way, parents, do you know we have to teach our kids right now? Right now, listen, and I have to tell my kids, kids, you don't need to have besties. You need to love everybody equally. But you know, un in inevitably, whoever's at the house at the time... You know, and, and it's okay when you get two or three kids, but when you get three, four, five kids, they start to click up little clicks and they hurt each other's feelings. Do you know as parents, it's really good to start working on Christian maturity, teaching it to our kids at an early age. I mean, I have to do it in the house because, you know, Sam and Isaac team up against Luke and Luke's on the outside looking in and he's mad about that. Or... Allie's really friends with Tori until Allie's friends come over, you know. And when Brooklyn comes over, then Tori is just... I'm kidding. Tori's always awesome. I don't see Tori. Is she helping in the nursery? Thank goodness. Is that right? <laughs> All right. don't want to get in trouble with Tori. But can I tell you something? The, the, I believe that the devil loves division. Matter of fact, the things that God hates, one of them is sowing discord among the brethren. And can I just say this? The foolishness of children, sometimes it doesn't get nipped in the bud, and you see it on full display in full-grown people. And he says, don't, don't do that. Listen, he said, I would like to hear of your affairs, and I'd like to hear from you that you are working together. But now, let's look at our text, verse 28. Because as he moves away from cooperation for the faith of the gospel... He then tells us, I, I love this phrase, verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Do you know you don't have to be afraid? Years ago I read an article by Colonel Jeff Cooper. He's passed away. He was a gun writer, and I don't know if he was a believer. But when the uh, Twin Towers fell, I believe, he mentioned that the war on terror he felt was bogus. He said, because terror is a very unsatisfactory foe. He said, because in some of our minds, terror doesn't exist. He said, you might kill me, but you're not going to terrorize me. Now, now, he said, what his point was, let's have a war with terrorists. Right? But do you know that, and by the way, he was just kind of one of these tough guys. And I don't think... M some kind of false machismo, machismo, or whatever you call it, tough guy act is what Paul's talking about here. When he says, in nothing terrified by your adversaries, he's saying that if you know Jesus, and if you understand the faith of the gospel, you don't have to be terrorized. You don't have to be terrified. You don't have to be scared. Listen, when, what time I am afraid, the psalmist said, I will trust in thee. Fear is a natural human experience, but we can have confidence over fear. Listen, fear not. It's one of the most oft-repeated words echoed from heaven. From Genesis to Revelation, you find it, whether it be Abraham or Isaac in Genesis 26, fear not. And in Romans 1.17, John says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet. He laid his right hand upon me, and uh, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and the last. Isn't that a great message from heaven? Fear not. Do you know that you don't have to be afraid? The Bible is clear that if you're a child of God, you don't have to be terrified. The word in nothing, there it says, in nothing, terrified. It's the idea of being terrorized, startled, spooked, frightened like a horse. You don't have to be spooked. 
Listen, it's hard to walk around in faith if you're controlled by fear. I like what the scripture says when it comes to encouragement. The fear knots in the word of God. You see some of those, whether it be God speaking to his men, Elijah the prophet speaking to the lady who was starving. Just recently I preached on that. and He said, fear not. Go and make me a cake. You won't run out of food. Amen. <laughs> Isaiah 41.10. This comes from the prophet. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 43.1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Isn't that beautiful? He says you don't have to fear. Now here's the thing. He didn't say there wasn't going to be any floods or fires. But he said, I'll be with you. And do you know what? He, the, the, the passage here in Philippians, Paul does not say, listen, if you're saved, there will be no enemies in your life. That's not what he said. He said that we don't have to be terrified by your adversaries. Make it clear. You should understand this clearly that God has promised that if you're following Him, there's going to be some people that don't like you. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, there's a list of things there that I hope I don't have to go through. But you know what? He was talking to people. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write to people who would go through those things. Can I just say this? Paul didn't say you're not going to be persecuted. Paul didn't say you're not going to have enemies. Paul didn't say you're not going to have problems, but he says you don't have to be terrorized, terrified by them. On a big scale, can I just say this is true? When we contend for the faith, we will encounter adversity. We have enemies, the flesh, the world, the devil. And those enemies are real. And listen, they war against our soul. But in this passage, he specifically references personal, physical, but may I say temporal, persecutors. The kind that Jesus referenced in Matthew 10, when he says, Fear them not therefore. Listen, I, I love this. When Jesus said, There's some that are going to hate you, Matthew 10, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple to be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. In verse 28 he says, Fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Jesus did not say there will be nobody against you, but He said you do not fear those whose power only extends to this life. Listen, you may say, well, Clay, the Philippians, they were going to experience persecution, but we live in a free country. Can I just say this? As the day draws near, persecution will come. Now, it may take different forms, but as Christians who are citizens of heaven refuse to bow the knee to a godless culture, and listen, and especially in this country, as we stand against the tide of evil, there will be a time when persecution will come. Listen, already, just north of here some years ago, a Canadian pastor was jailed for hate speech for simply preaching the Word of God. 
There's persecution. Listen, the, the left, the liberals, they claim, oh, these right-wingers want to ban books. Just check the history on this. Can I tell you something? When our, our, Go and check our libraries out. If anything, they censor God-honoring, Christ-centered books. Ban books. Listen, all around the country in school board meetings, the parents stand up and read filth that they are handing out to middle schoolers and junior hires, and it's so vile they don't even let them read it in the meeting, but they want to feed it to the children. But yet, an after-school Bible club is always persecuted and challenged. And can I just say this? We should expect that. We should expect that. Can I just say this? The darkness, when people don't know Christ, they're in the dark, they're just fulfilling their job description. We need to be a light that shines, but Jesus said in John chapter 3 that men, they hate light. They love the darkness because their deeds are evil. So we need to have this assurance that fear does not have to control us. And this confidence, it, he then ends it, and this is kind of a challenging little phrase that he throws in here. He says, In nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Now, what is an evident token of them of perdition? Well, first of all, the fact that, that you're their adversary, the fact that persecution comes the way of the Christian, the lost world looks and says, why are they going through that? Why don't they just bow the knee? Did you ever think about this? When persecution came to Philippi, and it did, do you know it's very possible, it's very likely, that the jailer who once laid stripes on Paul and Silas, you remember that? Do you know there's a chance that his lost friends see him going to the church house or see him hosting the church in his house? Don't you think there were some of those retired Roman officers that go, hmm, poor Joe, we lost him. I mean, he's, he's no longer faithful to Caesar. It's no longer Kaiser Curios, but it's Christ Curios. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar is Lord. See, persecution came to believers not because necessarily they were religious, but because they had a new king. They had a hierarchy. They were conducting themselves as citizens of heaven. And at some point, the Roman government didn't allow that. They said, listen, your fidelity has to be with us. And when a child of God refused to bow the knee to that cultural idolatry that was the Roman Empire, they were persecuted. And he says to them, it's a demonstration or evidence of perdition or destruction. Saul's own testimony. Do you know that when Saul, when he, when he saw Stephen... He held the garments of Stephen who with a face of like an angel beheld Christ standing at the right hand of God. And do you know what that did to Saul? Just read Acts. He was breathing out slaughter to the church of God. Do you know Paul says he did it out of zeal? Just as Jesus predicted, they that killed, he said those that kill you will think they do God a service. That was Paul's situation. He was, he was willing to persecute those who eventually he would be pastoring. God turned the tide. And listen, that's the story of the church, is that those who once hated God, and listen, in our own lives, in our own testimonies, listen, there's times, uh, for example, in my life, I remember being a church kid that wasn't saved, and I'd set up in the sound booth with garbage in my ears, or I'd do anything to distract myself from hearing the Word of God. I mean, you say, oh, but you were in church all the time. I know I was a drug baby. It's not original, but I think it's funny. I was drugged to church on Sunday morning, drugged to church on Sunday night, drugged to church on Wednesday night. I was a drug baby. And can I say something? I'm glad the Word of God doesn't return void. I'm glad I heard the Word. But Paul says that when the lost world, and listen, can I just say this? 
when you're lost, you aren't comfortable hearing the Word of God. You hate the light. A godly lifestyle is an open rebuke to a lost world. He says, to them it is a sign, a demonstration, a token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Do you know that when trouble comes, it is not evidence that God is not there. It is really a fulfillment of the promise that God is there. John 16, verse 33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. It's kind of like new recruits, privates fearing boot camp. Do you know what? No sergeant in their right mind on day one would say, You ladies have nothing to fear. Now there's literally ladies, but, you know, sergeants use probably language worse than that. But they didn't say there's nothing to fear, but there was a purpose in the suffering they were going to go through. And can I just say this? We don't have to be terrified about the persecution in this life because there is a crown on the other side. And we look forward to salvation. We can be of good cheer because Christ has overcome the world. And in this passage, do you know it kind of hints to me that how we handle adversity can be all the difference. When people see you go through difficulty, do they see you walking in salvation, walking in deliverance that God has promised? He says, but to you of salvation, it is evidence when you are persecuted for Christ's sake, it is evidence of salvation and that of God. I'm going to close with this. You know what salvation is? It's of God, the Bible says. When God does something in your heart that you can't even undo, God does something in your life and heart when He saves us and He translates us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light, when you are a born-again child of God, then listen, you should be filled with the fruits of the Spirit. And listen, you should be a, a changed person, but it's not because you turned over a new leaf, it's because God did a change in you. The Bible is clear, salvation is of the Lord. And I praise God for that because if salvation is of God, then no one can take it from me. He says, salvation is of God. Scripture's full of this truth. I'll just read a few examples. Psalms 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Why do we not fear? Because the Lord is our salvation. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. Psalms 37, 39. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Do you know that salvation is not a program? Do you know that if you were to line up ten religious people who probably went to buildings like this in America, churches, if you lined up ten quote-unquote Christian people and said, what is salvation? How do you get saved? Do you know you're liable to get four or five different answers? Right? And can I just say this? I praise God that I grew up in a church where I was taught that salvation is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm so grateful that I was taught that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Listen, I'm grateful that I was taught that it's not a list of do this and don't do this and do this and don't do this to be saved. But can I just say this? Many times in Baptist churches we look down on maybe a Catholic system that prescribes Ten different sacraments to make you right with God. And we, we correctly point out that those man-made hoops are not required to jump through. God does not require us to jump through hoops to make ourselves right with Him. But can I just say this? I know many times, even growing up, I kind of developed the idea that there was one sacrament, like this sinner's prayer thing. I've said the right words, push the right button, boom, you get salvation. Do you know that salvation is not a prayer? It's not a prayer. Do you remember the time and place you prayed and received? Listen, 
you, you do need to call on the Lord. But you know, calling on the Lord is you honestly conversing with the Lord and Savior, calling on His name. Do you know it's not about saying the right words? It's not. It's about being convicted by the Spirit of God and turning to Him in faith and just saying, Lord, Lord, I, I, I confess You as my Lord. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. Do you know that if you went through the Bible, you don't see anywhere where someone is really, quote-unquote, led through the Roman road. Now, I'm grateful if some of you are here just and taught on soul winning, and we're going to do some visitation, we're going to do some outreach, and we're going to prep people how to confidently lead someone to the Lord. But can I just say this? If the Lord ain't saving folks, we can't do it. Amen? The Lord is our salvation. Salvation is of God. And salvation is not a prayer, it's not a program, it's a person. And if you develop a relationship with God, then nobody can take that from you. If you develop a walk with the Creator, the Redeemer of mankind, salvation is of the Lord. He that hath the Son of God hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Isaiah 25, 9, It shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. Zephaniah 3.17. You probably don't hear Zephaniah quoted much. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in His love. He will joy over thee with singing. Do you know the Lord delights in saving people? That's such a blessing. Salvation is of the Lord. It's of the Lord. It's, it's a gift of God that He gives. But can I just say this? It is the Lord. Salvation is the Lord. It'd be very similar in me saying, for me, marriage is Lauren. Right? It's not just an abstract idea. It's a relationship. And if you're here tonight and you're saved, it's because you by faith have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've confessed Him as Lord. And that's the faith of the gospel that we contend for. So I ask you, do you have that? Because if you do, you don't have to be scared. Amen? If you're saved, you don't have to be scared. I don't know what tomorrow is going to hold, but I know who holds tomorrow. And listen, this is not a promise that you're going to go through life without difficulty. Listen, Paul did not just have persecutors. Paul himself had a thorn in the flesh that God chose not to remove. But he didn't have to fear. Listen, as long as I have the confidence that God is with me, then even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because God's with us. And guys, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But I, every time I hear news, whether it's about Israel or Russia or China, or you know, I have a lot better week when I don't watch the news. Amen? I have a lot better week when I just stay off of the news cycle. Just trust God. I, I don't I say we bury our heads and be ignorant, but can I just say this? I don't think we have to keep looking for the signs. We just need to be listening for the call. Amen? We don't have to live in fear. Listen, you may be here tonight and there may be a personal issue that's causing you to be fearful. Can I just say this? The Lord is our salvation. Well, I know my soul is saved, but see, I have this problem. The Lord is our salvation. Believers, you can put on the helmet of salvation. God is a deliverer and He will save. So tonight I want to ask you, are you saved? Are you saved? Have you received that from God? I believe there has to be a divine interaction. A, a divine... It, it's a divine exchange when God takes your sin and gives you the righteousness of Christ. I'm going to ask Megan to come to the piano tonight. See, he contrasts here the fruit of our conflict. And he says, to them, it's a, it's a token of perdition. Do you know that when a person's lost, they are bound to misread their circumstances? I said, Megan, I meant...
Kristen. Whoever plays the piano tonight. Amen. Do you know the lost world looks at believers? Listen, even believers live in right. And the lost world, not going to want that. I do think there's those that are lost and desperate and they're looking for the light. But there's a section of the lost world that they hate the light. Listen, just because you're not making everybody happy doesn't mean you're in sin. Jesus did not please everybody. Amen? That's something you should think about. If you're here tonight and you're lost, salvation is of the Lord. Would you receive by faith the salvation of God tonight? You may say, well, Clay, I'm not sure I understand that. Well, the Bible says this is the gospel that was delivered, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried and He rose again. Do you believe that He died? And I like this phrase, for our sins. See, if we're saved, it's because Jesus died for our sins. I'm saved. And when I stand before God, I can't atone for my sin. And I'm not innocent, but praise God, I'm justified. Amen? What a blessing. I'd like you to stand with me. As the piano plays, we're not going to have a long invitation at Lindsay Chapel. We have a time of invitation because I believe we should respond if God speaks to us. You may be here and be saved. But maybe there's an area in your life where you've allowed fear to control you. And maybe God wants you to lay that down. Listen, you may say, well, Clay, I'm fearful about this or about that. Well, have you taken it to God? Because you don't have to be terrified. You don't have to be in fear. Listen, you're either coming out of trouble or probably getting ready to go into trouble. But you don't have to fear. Are you saved? I know this is a Sunday night crowd, but it... It would break my heart to think that somebody would hear the Word of God preached and leave this place not saved. And the invitation never closes here. Even when we dismiss and close, if you need to be saved, you can be saved. You have to humble yourself. Repent. Turn from yourself and your sin and turn to Christ as Lord and Savior. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Have you been saved? While some are praying, if you don't come, you'll close the invitation. I think most of you know that little chorus. Would you sing that with me before we close? Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all.